good. Um, I trained as a primary school teacher, but I'm currently working as a note taker at UWE, uh, which means I get to sit in on a lot of uh, strange lectures, taking notes for disabled students. And I'm going to talk tonight about the difficulty of teaching science to kids, and particularly about the problem of uh, communicating scale and a sense of real cosmic awe, which for me is like one of my favourite things about learning science. So, let's start with some facts. Scientists love facts. <laughs> Children are very small. They start off pretty much the size of my forearm. Um, but by the time I get to teaching them, they're usually around waist height. They also haven't been around that long. They start off age zero, and by the time they got to me, they'd been alive for about maybe seven or eight years. In the scale of the universe, they aren't very big or very old. They've got no idea about this, though, because they're also very stupid. <laughs> this isn't really their fault, because they haven't had that long to spend in the library, and some of them can't even read. They don't realise this, though, and they're constantly making mistakes about how old and big things are. As a small example, um, I remember my sister doing a teaching placement at my mother's school, and constantly being asked if they were sisters. They don't know what old means. Old is just old. Grandparents are old, but so is ancient Greece, and dinosaurs, and the universe, and the children in year six. <laughs> Why then do we insist on confronting them with the most massive and oldest things we know about, like space, and dinosaurs, and deep sea? It's not very fair. So I want to start by concentrating on the problem of explaining age to kids. We use years to explain how old something is, but we can't really use those sorts of standard measures with them because they don't know what it means. They can't conceptualise what a year is. I mean, most children know how old they are, even down to their halves, before they know what fractions are, but they can't measure other things in those units. Like, trying to explain why an ancient Greece happened using them is very difficult. So, if you're seven years old, imagine you've lived your life 400 times backwards and that's roughly when the first Olympics happened. And it's unimaginable. And most children don't know their seven times tables up to 400. <laughs> and with dinosaurs, it's even worse. Argentinosaurus lived 238,000 times that. Again, ago. <laughs> <laughs> and what about size? How can you possibly explain just how big Argentinosaurus is? It was about 36 meters long, but what does that mean to a child? What does 36 metres mean? So we need to build towards conceptualising those units. And I now want to talk you through a lesson plan for beginning this. It starts outside, uh, with children finding a whole range of different sized objects. And then we're going to arrange them in size order. After that, we're going to get into pairs, someone's going to have a blindfold on, and someone else from another group is going to have to describe to them uh, the size of the biggest object that they found. And they might use language like bigger than and smaller than, but actually it's very difficult to communicate exactly how big it is without using units. So, we then introduce the idea of describing size using how many times the smallest object, like an acorn, fits across the bigger objects. And this makes things easier, but we can then introduce the problem that not all acorns are the same size. So, we can counter that by agreeing on a standard sort of acorn size and drawing that onto a ruler. Then we can begin introducing centimetres, then metres, and we can slowly work, to work towards explaining the size of Argentinosaurus. The problem is this takes years, and that's why a lot of children's books will measure big things in terms of cars or double-decker buses, which kids kind of have real-world experience of. In building up a concept like this, we might be a bit more likely to communicate a deeper understanding of what centimetres are and why we use them. And we also touch a bit on the history of archaic units, which gives a great insight into the way we build our knowledge, the sense of time and place, gratitude to other cultures and the importance of collaboration, and the joy of problem solving and refinement. We could easily just have handed the kid a ruler and explained how to use it, but that results in a very different sort of understanding, which I want to call like user or surface level understanding, and I hate it. <laughs> Unfortunately, the new national curriculum insists on rushing through these sorts of informal methods I mentioned earlier and towards standard algorithms and processes. 
Gove loves column methods because they're neat and efficient. But in my experience, many children who can apparently calculate just fine with those methods lack what teachers call a number sense, which is the kind of deeper understanding of what's going on. And that seems to undermine the supposed learning. But it's so much easier to cram teach that sort of surface information and easier to test. So the exam results look great. It means learning becomes mere, mere training to use these automagical machines. And anyone who's ever had to fix a computer for a technophobic relative will recognize the powerlessness this causes. And then I want to talk about my own experience of this sensation working as a note taker, reversing my role from teacher to student. At school, I dropped maths and sciences early on because people said I was all right at writing. So I just blindly pursued that without properly considering the consequences. But this job means I've been dropped into some really quite high level science and maths lectures with entirely foreign concepts that I really had no idea about, much like the children in my classes. And the way that my brains tried to like bridge that has been really interesting to me, especially in the context of my role of being a teacher. So for example, I remember sitting in on a third year mathematical biology lecture on modeling population growth and decline. The lecturer created this beautiful image of a group of birds moving between trees in some lush forest interacting and flourishing, breeding and dying. And he illustrated this story with perfectly stable graphs and phase lines and beautiful prophetic maths about carrying capacity. We had a break between lectures and I wandered around thinking about how sort of profound it all was. And then when I returned, he said, right, now we're gonna begin reducing the habitat through deforestation. We went past a certain threshold and the population nosedived and I lost my mind and I was like freaking out, choking up. <laughs> And I looked around the room, and I couldn't believe how disinterested everyone looked, because they're like checking their phones and chatting and whatever. And I suppose that's that sort of surface, like user level stuff. Like they know the function, they understand the graphs, but the motivation and consequences of learning about them can be very different. I also wanted to talk about um, cancer biology and cell signaling lectures. So when I left school with GCSE level science, uh, I understood that cells are the smallest unit of the body, these sorts of biological building blocks that make up everything that lives. And this is kind of wrong, like it's misleading. It completely ignores all the beautifully, unimaginably complicated webs of signals that control the way those cells act. And I left the first few cell signaling lectures just staring at my hands and completely tripping out about <laughs> this sort of like ecstatic pride and gratitude towards all my kinases and the kinase kinases and phosphate groups and ATP. And drinking coffee and exercise suddenly became monumental acts of self-enhancement. And uh, every breath was a miracle of cooperation. And my life suddenly got more interesting. And it made me think about my work as a teacher and how we were encouraged to teach science. Because like, Michael Gove prioritizes those user-level standard algorithms. But why are we teaching science and maths like that, in that instrumental way, to children who might not become professional scientists and mathematicians? And it's a common criticism that most people rarely need to use long division in real life, or that a lot of science is irrelevant. But surely that's missing the point. Surely, we should be conveying science instead as the best toolkit we have for decoding and enriching life at every level. And my experience of tripping out on kinases and breathing would never have happened if I hadn't by chance have been in that lecture. And it's terrifying and sad to think that many people haven't experienced that because it's been oversimplified and bastardized into a series of boring processes or impenetrable magic tricks by school. Sadly, teachers have been through that system too. And my experience, at least, has shown me that most teachers have a really warped understanding about what science actually is. And that's why I didn't go into straight teaching straight away, because I can't explain to a child how big and old an Argentinosaurus is, and what that actually means, because the constraints of the curriculum won't let me, and because the first person you need teaching about what science really means are teachers like me. Thank you very much.